wherever I go, I have fans. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I asked my colleague, <clears throat> should I start with a joke, but I'm not really good at jokes, so I guess the only thing I can say is, Forest Branch is really my name. <laughs> so let, let's just exercise these demons now. Not only that, but I grew up on Timbers Road. And Timbers Road dead ends into a road called Oakville Waltz. <laughs> and many of the roads in my area are named after trees. Willow, Sherwood, you name it. So, in all seriousness, let's talk about big problems, because that's what they are. Until they're solved, they're big, but they're not bigger than us. And let's talk about the kind of thinking and thinking systems that are going to be required in order for us, ah, there we go, in order for us to tackle these problems. And I'd like to start <clears throat> with something called the Shinkansen effect. It's a Nihongo word from Japan, and it comes from something called, you may be familiar with this, bullet train thinking. Anybody heard of bullet train thinking? One person, thank you. And let, let me take you to 1958. It's 1958. It's Tokyo. They've just been awarded the 64 Olympic Games. And the Ministry of Transport has issued a directive to Japan Railways. The current travel time from Tokyo to Osaka is 20 hours, including stops. 320 kilometers, that's 16 kilometers an hour. That signifies that it was probably a steam engine, which was still popular in those days, uh, as diesel engines were becoming new. So this was impossible. This is 1958. Nothing is fast. 1958. And so they came back and they said, that's impossible. We cannot do that. Out of bounds, completely out of bounds. But the kind of thinking that it took for the next six, seven years was amazing. And the end product of bullet train thinking is the Shinkansen effect. And that is when you overhaul your entire value chain to get a result, but that result's going to be bigger than your goal initially. So they had to do things to speed up the train. They had to expand the tracks from 700 millimeters to approximately 1.5 meters because a narrow track cannot travel very fast. You see the engines in the front of the train pulling a number of cars. They put electric motors in every single car. So every single car was pulling its weight. They had to reroute the train. They had to reroute it away from the mountains, away from climbs and, and declines and inclines. All of this, and they still had to make stops to pick up passengers. They had to rethink the ergonomic de uh, design. They had to rethink uh, the number of passengers, what the, what the tariff would be. But they had to reduce the time, and the clock was ticking. In the end, the Shinkansen effect from that kind of broad, bold thinking. It gave us the TGV train in France and the maglev in China, which travels over 500 kilometers an hour. Bullet train thinking, that thinking, the kind of revolutionary thinking that we're seeing today within the WFP in Namibia, for example. But that kind of thinking not only gave them a four-hour travel time from Tokyo to Osaka, but beyond Japan, it revolutionized the railway industry globally. Without that bold thinking, we might be today 20 years from a bullet train. Of course, today we have bullet trains because of Japan. It changed the railway industry globally, but it also changed the way the Japanese saw themselves. And that's very important. They had impossible odds, but the outcome was absolutely phenomenal. Today, we're talking about food systems. We're talking about agribusiness value chains. That's different than just agriculture. That's the person that's driving the refrigerated truck. That's the barcode. That's the track and trace. 
That's the processing. That's the type of packaging that you're using. It's, it's delivery to the supermarket. It's the pack house, which is refrigerated. It's all of those components. And so we want to apply bullet train thinking to some of the most difficult challenges of our time. So let's go to the Congo. This is a country that I'm learning to love. And my first visit was in 2017. What are the kinds of things that, that we would have to overhaul in a place like the DRC regarding its agribusiness value chain or its food system? But before we go there, a little audience participation. When I say Democratic Republic of Congo, I want you to shout it out. What is the first word that comes to your mind? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go one at a time. Somebody. Somebody said minerals. Rainforest. Good one. Carbon credits. Anyone else? Say again. Gorilla, mines, war. Anything else? Only, only good things? Potential bread basket. One more. Congo River. OK, I don't know if this group has been prepped, but everything was positive. So I'm happy to hear that. Give yourselves a round of applause, because everything you said was positive. The DRC is approximately 110 million people. We know that 50% of that population is under the age of 15. That means if you're talking agribusiness, you absolutely have to incorporate youth. Why? I'll tell you later. It has a population that doubles every 20 years. And one of the big challenges is there's a population of 27.5 million that face acute food shortages. That's bigger than Australia. So what would be the kinds of things that we would have to overall within the agribusiness value chain in order, as this young man said, to transition it into a breadbasket? What are some of the things that we'd have to do? I've got a couple. I, I don't have time to go into all of them. One of the things that I noticed uh, when I was doing some preliminary work for my company, Colagri, we were doing soil profiling and pH sampling uh, in, in Muchacha, about 25 kilometers south of Kowesi. Um, one of the things is that the students that graduate there from the University of Kowesi, which is a fine university, don't have practical experience. So one of the things we need to do across Africa, including the DRC, we need to vocationalize agricultural education. Agricultural, agriculture, what I inherited from my father, who was a farmer, and his father before him, going all the way back to the dark days of US slavery in the United States. But what I learned from him was hands-on. I was milling when I was in the third grade. We had an old rusty hammer mill, and that hammer mill was used to make cow feed before they were sent, they were fattened and sent to auction in a place called Dundee. So what are some of the things? Vocational education. Got to get the students out of the classroom, and we've got to get them into the tractor seat. Absolutely, we've got to mechanize. Another thing is, we absolutely have to have interior roads. Farmers cannot get their products to market if they do not have sufficient roads. We also need power for the evening, even if it's a light power. I think the RRT is one of the most relevant pieces of technology in terms of how it jump starts economic activities within a rural setting. So those are just some of the things we have to do. We have to incorporate youth because this generation of youth can digitize anything. Last night at the hotel, there's no remote. You have to use a QR code. You have to use your cell phone to select a channel and to turn the volume up or down. I was completely stuck for 45 minutes. <laughs> and my 17-year-old daughter was nowhere to be found. We have to incorporate women. We keep saying that, but we don't know why we say that. First of all, in Africa, like most places in the world, women are in the majority population. Hello. And if they're absent 
from participation in the agribusiness value chain, you are removing an influencer that has a great deal of influence on nutrition. So those are just some of the things. So if we look at bullet train thinking, and if we're trying to get the Shinkansen effect, and remember, what they received from that thinking was much bigger than what they had anticipated, and that's what we want for the DRC, that's what we want for the Congo, and any other place in the world where there is food insecurity. What would be the things that we would look for in terms of the effect? And that would be number one, today. No more potential. It is all about execution, implementation, and kinetics. Number one, we transition out of a $1.2 billion food aid program. Now, those programs are there for a reason because there's an emergency. But we want to grow a system that can anticipate and preempt food aid. Now, let's go a little further. How about addressing the three billion in food imports? I remember talking to a businessman and he was importing pork carcasses, pigs, hogs, all the way from Argentina. It's not a difficult animal to breed, and, and there's vast areas. There's a place called Manga Manga. It's about 30,000, 25, 30,000 square, uh, sorry, hectares. And, and it's a perfect place for doing something like that. It can be done locally. So those are the kinds of things that we would have to begin with. Then we move on. We want to leverage and utilize DRC's 25% ownership of the fresh water resource in Africa and 50% of the fresh water, resource, fresh water reserve resource in the country as well, in fact, on the continent. The third thing, we want to take advantage of the fact that the Congo Basin, which our colleague referred to earlier, that reaches 98% of the land base in, in that country. We want to invest there was a $6.6 .6 billion pledge that was made in October of 2023. We want to see that that capital is deployed immediately. And let's, let's do more than that. Let's supplement that. Let's be innovative. Let's, let's use blended financing where we take donor funding, we marry it with traditional forms of capital like debt and equity, and we reduce the overall weighted average cost of capital to the farmer. The last thing, the DRC has 80 million hectares, of which 29% are used. Only 29%. We need to roll out an immediate plan, even if we're adding 15 to 20% per year, until we maximize the areas that we can cultivate. And by the way, you won't be able to do that unless you put some tertiary interior roads in. So that's also a must. Finally, what would the Shinkansen effect be for a nation that has been the underdog, that has suffered negative stereotypes? What would that output be? It would be the DRC's ability today and tomorrow, next week and next month and next year, to feed approximately 25% of the world's population. We're not talking about just Africa. We're talking about 25% of the world's population, which that equates to about 2 billion people. So my message today to the nation, to the continent, to the people of the DRC, there are people in this room, there are people in this panel, in this forum, there are people within the WFP system we are ready to partner with you. We're ready to learn from you. We're ready to share expertise. We're ready to share best practices and insights and resources to make this happen so that together we can write the next chapter of the DRC's history, and that chapter will be characterized by food system and agribusiness value chain leadership, and better than that, Ownership. Thank you for your time. I hope you consider today time well spent. Thank you.